Good evening, and welcome to our Maundy Thursday service. This service is actually the first part of a three-part service known as the Triduum, which culminates with our celebration of our Lord's resurrection on Easter. At this time, I invite you to share the peace with those with you as you are able. We join in singing our opening hymn, When Charity and Love Prevail. Our service continues with the call to worship and invocation. Jesus sent Peter and John, saying, Go and prepare the Passover for us, that we may eat it. Lord, prepare our hearts to celebrate your passion. May we walk with Jesus to the upper room, the garden, the judgment hall, the cross, and the empty tomb. Jesus, may we see our salvation in your suffering, death, and resurrection. In the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Behold the Lamb of God, who takes away the sins of the world. Have mercy on us. For we have sinned against you in thought, word, and deed. In Christ you are blessed. In Christ you are forgiven. Go in peace. Amen. The Lord be with you. 
Let us pray. Lord, on this day you gave us a wonderful sacrament. May this sacrament of your body and blood so work in us that the way we live will proclaim the redemption you have brought. We pray this in your name. Amen. At the time of our offering, we thank you for your generous ongoing support of the Lord's work here at Trinity. We encourage you to continue to utilize online options or mail your offering in to the church office. The Holy Gospel for Monday, Thursday is from the 13th chapter of the Gospel of John. Now before the feast of the Passover, when Jesus knew that his hour had come to depart out of this world to the Father, having loved his own who were in the world, he loved them to the end. During supper, when the devil had already put it into the heart of Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, to betray him, Jesus, knowing that the Father had given all things into his hands, and that he had come from God and was going back to God, rose from supper. He laid aside his outer garments and, taking a towel, tied it around his waist. Then he poured water into a basin and began to wash the disciples' feet and to wipe them with the towel that was wrapped around him. He came to Simon Peter, who said to him, Lord, do you wash my feet? Jesus answered him, What I am doing you do not understand now, but afterward you will understand. Peter said to him, You shall never wash my feet. Jesus answered him, If I do not wash you, you have no share with me. Simon Peter said to him, Lord, not my feet only, but also my hands and my head. Jesus said to him, The one who is bathed does not need to wash except for his feet, but is completely clean, and you are clean but not every one of you. For he knew who was to betray him, and that was why he said, Not all of you are clean. When he had washed their feet and put on his outer garments and resumed his place, he said to them, Do you understand what I have done to you? You call me teacher and Lord, and you are right, for so I am. If I then, your Lord and teacher, have washed your feet, you also ought to wash one another's feet. For I have given you an example, that you also should do as I have done to you. Truly, truly, I say to you, a servant is not greater than his master, nor is a messenger greater than the one who sent him. If you know these things, blessed are you if you do them. I am not speaking of all of you. I know whom I have chosen, but the scripture will be fulfilled. He who ate my bread with me has lifted his heel against me. I am telling you this now before it takes place that when it does take place, you may believe that I am he. Truly, truly, I say to you, whoever receives the one I send, receives me, and whoever receives me, receives the one who sent me. This is the Gospel of the Lord. My dear friends in Christ, how strange it is to me, and I'm sure to you as well, to be speaking to you this Monday or Holy Thursday from my home to yours. In all of my 56 years of pastoral ministry, I've never experienced anything quite like what is happening in our nation and in our world today. And because of it, we may be fearful, anxious, troubled, and even depressed. But all the while, not without faith and confidence in our Lord and His constant and holy presence. Surely also our Lord's own disciples on that night which one of our hymns calls that dark and doleful night, the night before his suffering and death by crucifixion, must have felt that their world too was being turned upside down. In the midst of all of that, he gives two commands, thus the word mandi meaning command, and I want to speak to you briefly about those two commands to them and to us as well. The first one this, when he said, do this, in remembrance of me. And secondly, a new commandment I give to you, that you love one another, just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another. Remembrance. We probably know something about remembrance, about memories. Longingly, we may be remembering clearly this evening 
how we so often gathered in worship on this night and the other services of Holy Week. But the biblical meaning of remembrance is so much more than that. When, for example, we are told that our Lord God will remember our sins no more, it means that he will not bring what was in the past into the present. He means that what is in the past is simply gone. Our sins, as far as he are, is concerned, have vanished. But the opposite is also true, so that doing something in remembrance means to bring what is past into the present. What was real then becomes real now and for the future. So it is with joyful remembrance that our Lord Jesus Christ tells us to do this in his own appointed way. As often as you eat this bread and drink this cup, he says, do this, and this in particular, in remembrance of me. The command is clear and direct, and it remains in force for all time, for it means keep on doing this. This is his own way of bringing what he did for us in his saving work in the past into our present experience, of bringing the then into our now. And so it is a communion or a participation in his body, that very same body which was born of the Virgin Mary, the body that lived and spoke and healed and touched and cared for people, the body that was tortured, burdened with a cross and cruelly crucified, the body that appeared to confused and disbelieving disciples after his resurrection, the body that later ascended into heaven to be with us forever, everywhere. This body he gives us with the bread, along with the blood shed on the cross, as he says, for the remission of sins, given to us here with the wine. Clearly, this is not symbolic language. He is not using metaphors, as when, for example, he said, I am the door, or I am the bread of life, or I'm the light of the world. No, the words are, this is, literally, in some supernatural but very real way, his body and blood. And he commands us to eat and drink, to internalize his real presence into our real lives. It is a joyful remembrance. It is a celebration every time we offer it and every time we receive it. Of course, we come with reverence and humility, but we also come with joy and thanksgiving. We lift up our hearts, we give thanks, we sing with the host of heaven in anticipation, and we go in peace and thanksgiving. If our absence from the Lord's house of worship these days can result in any blessing, let it be in joyful anticipation of that time when once again we can share this holy and joyful remembrance together. And notice I said, together. The communion of joyful remembrance is not only vertical, it is also horizontal. It is not just between you and your Lord, it is between you and your sisters and brothers in Christ. That's why there is no room at the Lord's table for grudges and resentments, for bitterness and a failure to forgive. On that same night, Jesus demonstrated his love by washing the disciples' feet, taking the lowly form of the servant, and then later said, Love one another. Just as I have loved you, you also are to love one another, as I have loved you. And how is that? Well, it is the Master and Lord of the universe in the bodily form of the man Jesus getting down on the floor and doing the job of the servant, washing even the feet of Peter, who would deny him three times, and even Judas, who betrayed him, and all of them who would forsake him in fear. This same love would take him to the cross, not only for them, but for the sins of the whole world, for you and for me to reconcile us to God. The Holy Supper is for the forgiveness of sins, but not just forgiveness with God, but forgiveness between and among us as well. 
practicing what we believe when we say, I believe in the forgiveness of sins. Love one another. Better times are yet to come. They will come. And we look forward to approaching the Lord's table again, there to receive the fullness of his grace and peace. But even more assuredly, this Holy Supper is a foretaste of the feast which is to come, of the heavenly banquet when he assures and issues his gracious invitation. Come, blessed of my Father, inherit the kingdom prepared for you from the foundation of the world. Amen. And the peace of God, which passes all understanding, keep your hearts and minds in Christ Jesus. Amen. Our service continues as we join together in confessing our common Christian faith using the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord. He was conceived by the power of the Holy Spirit and born of the Virgin Mary. He suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven and is seated at the right hand of the Father. He will come again to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. We join in singing our hymn of the day, An Upper Room Did Our Lord Prepare. servants of our Lord Jesus Christ. On the night before his death, Jesus set an example for his disciples by washing their feet, an act of humble service. He taught that strength and growth in the life of the kingdom of God come not by power, authority, or miraculous sign, but by such lowly service. While we are not able to do the hand-washing that is our custom on Maundy Thursday, following our Lord's example, I invite you, the body of Christ, 
to continue to reach out to others with servant hearts as an act of love and humility. Let us pray now for the whole people of God in Christ Jesus and for all people according to their needs. Lord, on this holy night, when you gathered with your disciples in the upper room, we give you thanks and praise for the gift of your body and blood in the sacrament of the Lord's Supper. May your body given for us and your blood shed for us be for our souls the highest good. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. Lord Jesus, as we walk with you in these climactic last days of your passion, draw us to you. Strengthen our faith and our walk with you. Imprint your image upon our hearts. May we daily listen to you and seek to live like you. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray, O Lord, that you would bring comfort to those who mourn, peace to those who are anxious, healing to those who are ill or injured. Deliver our nation and our world from the COVID-19 pandemic. Turn our hearts to you in all circumstances. Lord, in your mercy, hear our prayer. We pray all of these things in Jesus' name, he who has also taught us to pray. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread and forgive us our trespasses as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. We join now in singing our closing hymn, Go to Dark Gethsemane. <laughs> 